Keeping the soil consistently moist around tomatoes can make a big difference in your harvest. One of the reasons I like to do it is because with certain varieties, they have a tendency to get a little blossom end rot. Some of the heirloom varieties that have such great flavor, like this black creme, which is a Russian heirloom tomato, it can be a little fussy on the disease side. And you can see here, I've got some blossom end rot on these. So that told me, hey, I need to get some mulch around the soil because we're having a, a hotter and drier than normal summer. Keeping that soil consistently moist and trying to keep the temperature of the soil about the same, insulating it with this old rotted straw is a great way to achieve this. Now, another reason you can get blossom end rot has to do with the soil chemistry. If you have a lack of calcium in the soil, that can cause blossom end rot as well. You can actually spray your tomatoes with a calcium infused water, which can help. We limed the soil, just using hydrated lime in the early spring to make sure that the soil pH is sweet enough. And I don't think that's my problem here. I think it's just, I don't have enough moisture in the soil consistently to keep this from happening. And as you can see over here, I've got a lot of leaves and this would make a great mulch as well. To keep them from blowing around the garden, just run the lawnmower over them and chop them up a little bit and they'll stay in place much better. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. Now, Justin, I have to say, this is quite um, a play on an old Southern favorite, the watermelon. Who doesn't love watermelon? Everybody loves watermelon. <laughs> and the cool thing about it, it takes it from that sweet treat that we all know mm -hmm. to a really savory salad when you throw it on the grill and get a little grill marks watermelon on it. Watermelon on the grill. Watermelon on the grill. You can grill anything. You want these quartered, right? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right. You're doing just right. At about uh, two inches thick each. And we have eight pieces. That's right. What's next? If you will get to slicing those yellow tomatoes okay. there and, a, and maybe a few of those small jewel tomatoes. Okay. Great. I'm going to throw these on the grill and then I'm going to make the dressing. Okay, great. Now about how long do you keep the watermelon pieces on the grill? It depends on how hot your grill is. Mine has been preheating here for a good long while. I would say the surface of it is probably around 750 degrees. So it's good and hot and it's going to mark it fairly quickly. So you want to watch them. You can't really burn them, but yes, you, you <laughs> don't, if you overcook them, you're going to end up with a mushy melon. I was going to say mush. And nobody likes a mushy melon. Then you flip them because you have that beautiful sort of marking. Well, I just turn them a quarter turn. I don't flip them to the other side. If you flip them to the other side, you've got that heat going all the way through. I see. Mm -hmm. You will get the mushy melon. You will get the mushy melon. So for the dressing, we're going to use this lime, mm -hmm. the juice, and the zest of one lime. So great flavor. This has to be one of the most favorite recipes in your cookbook. It really is. Particularly for this time of year. Yes, uh, tomatoes and watermelon, it's summer. Mm -hmm. So lime juice, honey, about how much honey was it? Two tablespoons and okay. two tablespoons of olive oil. Okay. Uh, depending on uh, how much heat you like, this is cayenne pepper. I'm just gonna give us just a, just a little kick. Yeah, about an eighth of a teaspoon. About an eighth of a teaspoon. Then we want to zest this lime here. Mm, I love zest. I do too. I've got these sliced. Is that about enough, you think? I think we're ready to rock. Okay. I'm going to hand this to you. All right. And just to emulsify the dressing, I want you to shake that up. All right. So Justin, what do we have here? Enough dressing for the eight pieces? That's right. It'll serve uh, four as a light main dish uh, in the summer, or if it's a first mm. course, It'll serve eight. Look at those, beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I can see how you just cooked them on one side, but you gave them a quarter turn to give that nice marking. Presentation is everything. Beautiful, got it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Close that down. And there it is. Perfect. Okay. If you'll start. hand me two of those big yellow sliced tomatoes. Right, okay. There we go. I like to put those right down on the plate just like that. Like that. And then uh, we'll just put that right there. Okay. Uh, if you'll hand me that ancho chili powder. Okay, here we go. This is... Um, I wondered what you were going to do with that. We go just right over the top with it, and then we're going to go with a little bit of this goat cheese. I just like just to do top. just a little dollop. Touch. There we go. Okay. Now, Alan, if you will uh, give it a few of those tomatoes. Right, I sliced a few of these little great tomatoes. Just right around the plate, maybe a few on top of it. And then uh, you shook this dressing up for us. If you will pour it on there, I'm going to get just a few sprigs of cilantro. Okay. Now, you just want it drizzled over the top? Just drizzle it over the top. Okay. Just get crazy with it. All right. That's okay. perfect. That's pretty good. And we'll go just a few sprigs of cilantro. 
Well, I've had a tomato and watermelon salad before, but never grilled and presented like this. Well, we try, we try and keep it fresh. Mm, marvelous, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. You know, getting into gardening is a really cool thing. It can grow so much, I just love it. And I always try to help people out who are just getting started, beginner gardeners. First of all, don't take on too much. You know, you get excited about something, you wanna conquer the world. The idea is to stay small, have small victories like container gardening. Grow something in containers, grow tomatoes in containers first or these raised beds. The second thing is that planting plants in the right place. Read the labels. You know, if it says full sun, don't put it in the shade because it ain't gonna grow. If it says it likes shade, don't put it in the full sun because it's gonna look like a crispy critter. The other thing is don't plant things too deeply. Gardeners really wanna pile stuff up. I mean, soil all around the base of plants and they really don't like it. The other thing is watering. Don't overwater your plants. You don't want them sitting in water, okay? So you're into it, you're loving your plants, you're giving them too much love in the way of water and you're gonna kill them. The other thing is like bulbs. You know, I've got some bulbs here that I'm gonna plant and um, people plant them upside down and I don't get that. The basal plate of a bulb is right here at the bottom. You can kind of see where the roots will come out. That goes down. It's like a Hershey candy kiss. From the garden home, I'm Alan Smith. I don't know what the deal is this year, but the wasps seem to be everywhere. And I don't know about you, but I'm a live and let live kind of guy, but when it comes to wasps, I don't know. They sting and they hurt, so I want them out of my life. Here are a couple of ways that will help you make sure there are no wasps around. First thing I want to show you is a repellent, which is really easy to make. All you need is a spray bottle like this. What's great about this recipe is it's all natural. It's water and peppermint oil. You see, wasps hate peppermint oil. So what you wanna do is you just wanna take one tablespoon of peppermint oil to four cups of water. Just like this. Add the water. You can spray this directly onto the wasp's nest. And you're like going, yeah, okay, when am I gonna do that? Because you don't wanna get stung. Well, spray them when they're sort of drowsy or asleep. So spray them at night or in the very early morning. And what you'll find is that peppermint oil, by the way, this smells really good, peppermint oil will kill the larvae, the eggs, and the adults. And they hate the aroma of this so badly that they will not return back to the nest. So think about that. Now let me show you how to make a wasp trap. All you need is a two liter bottle. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna invert the top of the two liter bottle like this. So let me show you, I've already started this one. You simply cut it, cut the top fifth off of it like this, all the way around. Ta -da. And then this is placed like this. And then you just simply take some duct tape. Who can live without duct tape? Just take some duct tape around the top, just like that, okay? Now, the idea is that you pour a liquid in here that attracts the wasp. They follow it down into here, and they can't get out. And they die floating around in whatever liquid you use. Now, I'm making a simple syrup, which is so simple, you'll always be able to remember this recipe. It's actually one cup of boiling water to one cup of sugar. And when this goes into solution, all you wanna do is allow that to cool, and it will look like this. And then you simply pour it in to the wasp trap like that. You don't have to use it all up, that's plenty. You can also use beer. Yes, wasps are attracted to beer. But this you can make, keep in the refrigerator, crack the wasps and kill them there if they're flying around and bothering you. While lilies, dahlias, and cannas might be a staple for your spring planting and summer bloom, there's one flower that I want you to think about. You don't want to overlook it. It's the crocosmia. Odd name, but beautiful flower. You can see by its grass-like foliage that Crocosmia is a member of the iris family, but the real visual impact comes in its blooms. You see, they grow along the stem to create an arch-like spike effect, and they can be found in several different color varieties. 
For instance, if you want a flower that really demands attention, the bold red of this variety called Lucifer will not be ignored. But if you're looking for a flower that radiates sunshine, try planting this variety called George Davidson. Its yellow blooms will brighten up your beds in no time. Crocosmias are also available in more subtle, two-toned hues that play well with a variety of other flowers. So this spring, be sure to add some crocosmia to your garden. They'll begin to bloom in summer and you're going to be really glad you did it. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. I don't know about you, but I love butterflies. They are so beautiful in the garden. I could just sit and watch them for hours. You know, you can attract butterflies to your garden if you give them a food source. They love things like fennel and dill, plants like Queen Anne's Lace. The babies love it. Then when they evolve into a fully grown butterfly, they need a different food source. They have a feeding tube called a proboscis, which allows them to dip in and take nectar. They also love to get moisture from the ground. If you've ever noticed little mud puddles after a rain and the butterflies all around the edge of it taking up moisture, well, you can simulate that in your home, but you can also fortify it with nutrients so you can have really healthy butterflies, which is great. The recipe is really simple. You're just basically making a mud pie. Now, I've just created this one to show you as an example. This is just an aluminum container, and I filled it with mud and a solution of water, sugar, and salt. You see, all I did was take one cup of water, three teaspoons of sugar, and just a little pinch of salt. Yes, salt. Mix this together. And then you just pour it over the soil. In this case, what I've done is put the mud in a ceramic container. Now what will happen is the butterfly can land on this edge and can take the moisture up. You see, if they get too close to water, there's a chance that the wind could possibly blow them into the water and their wings get stuck to the water. It messes with the scales and can harm them. So these sorts of setups are really good for butterflies. If you use something like this in a disposable container, you may want to dig out a little circle, the same diameter as this, and sink it into the soil and let the soil come up to the edge. Now you don't have to use this solution. You can use some discarded things from the refrigerator. Say if you have a sports drink or if you have a, a can of beer that's gone flat or a soda that's gone flat, you can pour that in and the butterflies will love it. And hey, think about this. If you put all these places for butterflies to feed in your garden, they're going to come from all your neighbors and hang out with you. Nice idea for the summer. Who doesn't have areas in their garden or landscape that they want to screen or hide? You know those eyesores that you don't want to look at? One way to look at it is, well, an opportunity. An opportunity to plant a living screen in the form of a hedge. Take a look at this hedge. This is actually needlepoint holly. And you can see that it's about five feet tall. And when I planted it, I started with plants this size. This plant will grow about a foot and a half once it gets established a year, which is pretty impressive. I planted these about every three feet apart. And then over time, they began to knit together as well as grow up and hide the area that I wanted to screen. You see, you can't even look through here. I mean, there could be a used car lot on the other side and you'd never know it. But in this case, there's just a greenhouse over there on the other side. Now, what's great about these needlepoint hollies, it's evergreen, it has beautiful red berries on it throughout the fall and the winter and very early spring, and it delivers what it promises. It's a great screening plant. The key to growing a plant like this is getting the right plant in the right place. These plants love full sun, they love soil that's well drained, and you want to make sure that the moisture level is, well, consistent. Come on over here, let me show you something else. As you can see, this hedge is taller. It was planted at the same time as that other one. We just allowed it to grow up higher before we started cutting it off horizontally. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. You know, you can grow fruit trees in lots of different ways. You can buy those little dwarfs, you can get semi-dwarfs, you can get big fruit trees, or you can even grow them in a pattern like this. We just call it an espalier. And I had these, um, these metal supports created for this particular type of pear. And uh, what I'm trying to do is prune through it so you can see the shape. And it's actually in, in a shape called the candelabra. And what I like to do is this time of year, come through here and find where my fruit sets are. You can see there's a little baby pear right there. 
But what I want to do is preserve this candelabra shape. And I'm doing that by taking these really long limbs. You see how fast they grow in the spring and get these things cut off uh, so that light can get in here and what fruit I do have will, will ripen. Plus, I love to see the shape. I think this form is so sculptural and so beautiful. And what you want to do is you want to go in and just want to take off right at the spur. These are spurs here where usually you'll find the fruit set. And I'm just taking out some of that because I want to preserve this single trunk here and I don't want a lot of side shoots on it. So that's why I'm taking them off. But I'm leaving a spur like this. I might actually get a bud here with a flower on it for fruit next year. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. Often people, when they think about their gardens, they think about flowers. I want lots and lots and lots of flowers and they don't think about foliage. Look at these leaves. With leaves like this and with all of this color and texture going on, you hardly need a bloom. But these are cannas and they will also flower. And you can see the flower buds beginning to emerge here. These will have a beautiful bright orange bloom. So just imagine the orange with these striped chartreuse leaves, exquisite. If you're into this colorway and this level of variegation and striping, there's several varieties to choose from, like Bengal Tiger, there's Pretoria, and one called Tropicana. They're really beautiful. No matter what type canna you grow, they're all gonna require the same growing conditions. You see, they like lots of full sun, and they really start to rock and roll in the garden when it heats up in the summer. The other thing that they need is plenty of moisture. In fact, you can even grow cannas in standing water. So if you have a low boggy area, perfect plant. And all the way up through zone seven in this country, you can leave cannas out all winter and they come back. So they're perennial for me in my garden. That's one of the reasons I love them. Now let's go take a look at a different variety. Blooms a little earlier, but has a really dark purplish red leaf. Come on. So take a look at this red leaf variety. And I just love this bright, bright red flower. It looks good with other plants as well. This is Citrus Blend Lantana. I think an excellent combination. Just look at how these reds are rocking together. Now, one of the things I want to point out here, which is important about cannas, is that you can actually grow them in containers. If you do, you want to make sure you have a saucer under there, because remember, cannas like moisture. Now, the only pest that I've found with cannas is a little pesky critter called a leaf roller. It will roll up the leaf and it's a little caterpillar and you can see there's the little devil right there. And what it will do is it will roll up a leaf and it will munch on the foliage of the leaf until it morphs into, well, some sort of moth or flying object. So what you want to do is spray your cannas, if you get this, with BT. You can get it anywhere. It's a great organic insecticide and it will kill any kind of caterpillar. Sometimes the tiniest little blooms can pack the biggest punch. They can be quite a surprise, particularly when they're delivered in multitude. And when they constellate with other flowers, you can see here, these tiny little blooms juxtapose these petunias are the perfect contrast of the tiny to the large. These little micro flowers, if you will, really set off the larger flowers. One of my favorites is Lobularia. This one's called White Knight. You can see how dense it is. It's quite an improvement from the old fashioned sweet alyssum in that it flowers all the time. Another tiny flowered annual to think about is this one, which is a euphorbia. This one is called Diamond Frost and it has a cousin called Diamond Delight, which has double flowers and is even more compact. It's worth checking out. And then take a look over here. Another one perfect for hanging baskets really a classic for the hanging basket. This one's called Lobelia Sky Blue. And I just love that blue color, these tiny little blooms. You see, all of those little blooms, when delivered in multitude like that, can really create quite a visual impact. And that's what you're looking for. And these are perfect for hanging baskets. So when you're thinking about creating a container, think about color, but also think about texture and how that texture might be delivered through the contrast of larger flowers and these tiny little microchips.
If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and be sure to ring the bell for notifications.